Hi, and welcome to Mrs. Pam Reads. Today we are continuing in our story, Water for Elephants by Sarah Bruin. In our last video, basically we met Jacob. Um, we know that he lives in a nursing home. He's in his 90s. He had a little altercation maybe uh, with one of his fellow nursing home members. And uh, it kind of came out maybe that he used to work for the circus. <laughs> and the circus is in town. So let's see what happens. Chapter two. I'm 23 and sitting beside Catherine Hale. Or rather, she's sitting beside me because she came into the lecture hall after I did, sliding nonchalantly across the bench till our thighs were touching and then shrinking away with a blush as though the contact were accidental. So we're going kind of back into his past memory. Catherine is one of only four women in the class of 31 and her cruelty knows no bounds. I've lost track of all the times I've thought, oh God, Oh God, she's finally going to let me, only to be hit in the face with, dear God, she wants me to stop now. Hmm. I am, as far as I can tell, the oldest male vir virgin on the face of the earth at 23. Hmm. Certainly no one else my age is willing to admit it. Even my roommate Edward has claimed victory although I'm inclined to believe the closest he's ever come to a naked woman was between the covers of his eight pagers. Not too long ago, some of the guys on my football team paid a woman a quarter, uh, okay, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we're gonna skip that part. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, and he simply couldn't participate. Good for him. And so, in 10 days, after six long years of dissections, castrations, pullings, and shoving my arm up a cow's rear end more times than I care to remember, I and my faithful shadow virginity will leave Ithaca and join my father's veterinary practice in Norwich. And here you can see Evidence of thickening of the distal small intestines, says Professor Willard McGovern, his voice devoid of inflection. Using a pointer, he pokes languidly at the twisted intestines of a dead salt and pepper milk goat. This, along with enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes, indicates a clear pattern of... The door squeaks open and McGovern turns, his pointer still buried in the doe's belly. Dean Wilkins walks briskly into the room and mounts the stairs to the podium. The two men confer, standing so close their foreheads nearly touch. McGovern listens to Wilkins' urgent whispers and then turns to scan the row of students with worried eyes. All around me, students fidget. Catherine sees me looking and slides one knee over the other, smoothing her skirt with languorous fingers. I swallow hard and look away. Jacob Jankowski? I, I'm in shock. I drop my pencil. It rolls under Catherine's feet. I clear my throat and rise quickly. Fifty-some pair of eyes turn to look at me. Yes, sir? Can we have a word, please? I close my notebook and set it on the bench. Catherine retrieves my pencil and lets her fingers linger on mine as she hands it to me. I make my way to the aisle, bumping knees and stepping on toes. Whispers follow me to the front of the room. Dean Wilkins stares at me. Come with us, he says. I've done something. That much is clear. I follow him into the hallway. McGovern walks out behind me and closes the door. From the moment 
the two of them stand silent, arms crossed, faces stern. My mind races, dissecting my every recent move. Did they go through the dorm? Did they find Edward's liquor? Or maybe even the eight pagers? Dear Lord, if I get expelled now, my father will kill me. No question about it. Never mind what it will do to my mother. Okay, so maybe I drank a little whiskey, but it's not like I had anything to do with the fiasco in the cattle barn. Mm. Dean Wilkins takes a deep breath, raises his eyes to mine, and claps a hand on my shoulder. Son, there's been an accident. A slight pause. An automobile accident. Another pause, longer this time. Your parents were involved. I stare at him, willing him to continue. Are they, will they? I'm sorry, son. It was instant. There was nothing anyone could do. I stare at his face, trying to maintain eye contact, but it's difficult because he's zooming away from me receding to the end of a long black tunnel. Stars explode in my peripheral vision. You okay, son? What? Are you okay? Suddenly, he's right in front of me again. I blink, wondering what he means. How the hell can I be okay? Then I realize he's asking whether I'm going to cry. He clears his throat and continues. You'll have to go back today to make a positive identification. I'll drive you to the station. The police superintendent, a member of our congregation, is waiting on the platform in street clothes. He greets me with an awkward nod and stiff handshake. Almost as an afterthought, he pulls me into a violent embrace. He pats my back loudly and expels me with a shove and a sniff. Then he drives me to the hospital in his own car, a two-year-old phaeton that must have cost the earth. So many things people would have done differently had they known what would happen that fateful October. The coroner leads us to the basement and slips through a door, leaving us in the hallway. After a few minutes, a nurse appears holding the door open in wordless invitation. There are no windows. There is a clock on one wall, but the room is otherwise bare. The floor is linoleum, olive green and white, and in the middle are two gurneys. Each has a sheet-covered body on it. I can't process this. I can't even tell which end is which. Are you ready? The coroner asks, moving between them. I nod and swallow. My hand appears, oh, a hand appears on my shoulder. It belongs to the superintendent. The coroner exposes first my father and then my mother. They don't look like my parents, and yet they can't be anyone else. Death is all over them in the mottled patterns of their battered torsos, the eggplant purple. Um, okay, so this goes a little bit descriptive. We'll skip that little bit. I turn as vomit explodes from my mouth. Someone is there with a kidney dish, but I overshoot and hear liquid splash across the floor, splattering against the wall. Hear it because my eyes are squeezed shut. I vomit again and again until there's nothing left. Despite this, I remain doubled over and heaving until I wonder if it's possible to turn inside out. They take me somewhere and plant me in a chair. A kindly nurse in a starch white uniform brings coffee, which sits on the table next to me until it grows cold. Later, the chaplain comes and sits beside me. He asks if there is anyone he can call. I mumble that all of my relatives are in Poland. He asks about neighbors and members of our church, but for the life of me, I can't come up with a single name. 
not one. I'm not sure I could come up with my own, if asked. When he leaves me, I slip out. It's a little over two miles to our house, and I arrive just as the last sliver of sun slips beneath the horizon. The driveway is empty, of course. I stop in the backyard, holding my valet and staring at the long, flat building behind the house. There's a new sign above the entrance, the lettering glossy and black. E. Jankowski and Son, Doctors of Veterinary Medicine. After a while, I turn to the house, climb the stoop, and push open the back door. My father's prized possession, a Philco radio, sits on the kitchen counter. My mother's blue sweater hangs on the back of a chair. There are iron lines on the kitchen table, a vase of wilting violets, an overturned mixing bowl, two plates, and a handful of cutlery set to dry on a checked dish towel spread out by the sink. This morning, I had parents. This morning, they ate breakfast. I fall to my knees right there on the back stoop howling in displayed hands. The ladies of the church auxiliary, alerted to my return by the superintendent's wife, swoop down on me within the hour. I'm still on the stoop, my face pressed into my knees. I hear gravel crunching under tires, car doors slamming, and the next thing I know, I'm surrounded by doughy flesh, flowered prints, and gloved hands. I am pressed against soft bosoms, poked by veiled hats, and engulfed by jasmine, lavender, and rose water. Death is a formal affair, and they're dressed in their Sunday best. They pat and they fuss, and above all, they cluck. Such a shame, such a shame, and such good people, too. It's hard to make sense of such tragedy. Surely it is but the good Lord works in mysterious ways. They will take care of everything. The guest room at Jim and Mabel Neuer's house is already made up. I am not to worry about a thing. They take my valet and herd me toward a running car. A grim faced Jim Neuer is behind the wheel, gripping it with both hands. Two days after I bury my parents, I am summoned to the offices of Edmund Hyde Esquire to hear the details of their estate. I sit in a hard leather chair across from the man himself as it gradually sinks in that there is nothing to discuss. At first, I think he's mocking me. Apparently, my father has been taking payment in the form of beans and eggs for nearly two years. Beans and eggs? My voice cracks in disbelief. Beans and eggs? And chickens and other goods. I don't understand. It's what people have, son. The community's been hit right hard and your father was trying to help out. Couldn't stand by and watch animals suffer. But I don't understand. Even if he took payment in uh, whatever, how does that make everything belong to the bank? They fell behind on their mortgage. My parents didn't have a mortgage. He looks uncomfortable, holds his steepled fingers in front of him. Well, yes, actually they did. No, they didn't, I argue. They lived here for nearly 30 years. My father put away every cent he ever made. The bank failed. I narrow my eyes. I thought you just said it all goes to the bank. He sighs deeply. It's a different bank. The one that gave them the mortgage when the other one closed, he says. I can't tell if he's trying to give the appearance of patience and failing miserably or is blatantly trying to make me leave. I pause, weighing my options. What about the things in the house? In the practice, I say finally, it all goes to the bank. What if I want to fight it? How? What if I come back and take over the practice and try to make the payments? 
doesn't work like that. It's not yours to take over. I stare at Edmund Hyde in his expensive suit behind his expensive desk in front of his leather-bound books. Behind him, the sun streaks through lead-paned windows. I am filled with sudden loathing. I'll bet he's never taken payment in the form of beans and eggs in his life. I look forward and make eye contact. I want this to be his problem too. What am I supposed to do? I ask slowly. I don't know, son. I wish I did. The country's fallen on hard times and that's a fact. He leans back in his chair, his fingers still steepled. He cocks his head as though an idea has just occurred to him. I suppose you could go west, he muses. It dawns on me that if I didn't get out of this office right now, I'm going to slug him. I rise, replace my hat, and leave. When I reach the sidewalk, something else dawns on me. I can think of only one reason my parents would need a mortgage, to pay my Ivy League tuition. The pain from this sudden realization is so intense, I double over, clutching my stomach. Because no other options occur to me, I return to school, a temporary solution at best. My room and board is paid up until the end of the year, but that is only six days away. I've missed the entire week of review lectures. Everyone is eager to help. Catherine hands me her notes and then hugs me in a way that suggests I might get different results if I were to attempt the usual quest. I pull away. For the first time in living memory, I have no interest in sex. I can't eat. I can't sleep. And I certainly can't study. I stare at a single paragraph for a quarter of an hour, but can't absorb it. How can I? When behind the words, on the white background of the paper, I'm watching an endless loop of my parents' death, watching as their cream-colored Buick flies through the guardrail and over the side of the bridge to avoid old Mr. McPherson's red truck. Old Mr. McPherson, who confessed as he was led from the scene that he wasn't entirely sure what side of the road he should have been on, and thinks that maybe he hit the gas instead of the brake. Old Mr. McPherson, who showed up at church one legendary Easter without trousers. The proctor shuts the door and takes his seat. He glances at the wall clock and waits until the minute hand wobbles forward. You may begin. 52 exam booklets flip open. Some people rifle through it. Others start writing immediately. I do neither. 40 minutes later, I have yet to touch pencil to paper. I stare at the booklet in desperation. There are diagrams, numbers, lines, and charts, strings of words with terminal punctuation at the end. Some are periods and some question marks, and none of it makes sense. I wonder briefly if it is even English. I try it in Polish, but that doesn't work either might as well be hieroglyphics. A woman coughs and I jump. A bead of sweat falls from my forehead onto my booklet. I wipe it off with my sleeve and then pick the booklet up. Maybe if I bring it closer or hold it farther away, I can see now that it is in English or rather that the individual words are English, but I cannot read from one to another with any sense of continuity. A second drop of sweat falls. I scan the room. Catherine is writing quickly, her light brown hair falling over her face. She is left-handed, and because she writes in pencil, her left arm is silver from wrist to elbow. Beside her, Edward yanks himself upright, glances at the clock in panic, and slumps over his booklet. I turn away toward a window. Snatches of sky peek through leaves, a mosaic in blue and green that shifts gently with the wind. I stare into it, allowing my focus to soften, looking beyond the leaves and the branches. A squirrel bounds fatly across my sight line, its tail 
full and cocked. I shove my chair back with a violent screech and stand up. My brow is beaded, my fingers shaking. 52 faces turn to look. I should know these people, and up until a week ago, I did. I knew where their families lived. I knew what their fathers did. I knew whether they had siblings and whether they liked them. Hell, I even remember the ones who had to drop out after the crash. Henry Winchester, whose father stepped off the ledge of the Board of Trade Building in Chicago. Alistair Barnes, whose father shot himself. Reginald Monty, who tried unsuccessfully to live in a car with his family, could no longer pay for his room and board. Bucky Hayes, whose unemployed father simply wandered off. But these ones, the ones who remain, nothing. I stare at these faces without features, these blank ovals with hair, looking from one to the next with increasing desperation. I'm aware of a heavy, wet noise and realize it's me. I'm gasping for breath. Jacob? The face nearest me has a mouth and it's moving. The voice is timid, unsure. Are you okay? I blink, unable to focus. A second later, I cross the room and toss the exam booklet onto the proctor's desk. Finished already, he says, reaching for it. I hear paper rustling as I head for the door. Wait, he calls after me. You haven't even started. You can't leave. If you leave, I can't let you. The door cuts off his final words. As I march across the quad, I look up at Dean Wilkins' office. He's standing at the window, watching. And we're going to stop there because it's a long chapter. <laughs> so some of the chapters are longer than others. Some will complete in one reading. Others will have to break into two. All right. Well. Bad news for Jacob, but the explanation for how the story gets started to go on the way that it does, right? All right, you guys, I hope you come back and find out what happens in the rest of chapter two. I also hope that you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. <laughs>